We're going to work our way through that. Okay. Okay, everybody knows what this is. Somebody tell me what this is. Engine. That engine. And this right here. This is a simplified drawing. That's a fully gone transmission. Okay. This right here on this particular uh, slide, this particular handout is called drive shaft, but you are going to read some shop manuals that call it a propeller shaft. And the newer ones are made of aluminum. This is a hollow tube. A uh, hollow tube actually has more turning power than a solid piece of steel it's without shearing. Huh? Yeah, it's stronger, yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, it's got, as far as the turning power, it's got more, or it can handle more. Now this right here is your rear axle assembly. You notice it's, everything is spinning this way, and then everything has got to spin this way, so in here you've got to have some gears. The differential is in there. We call that a differential. It sounds like a complicated name for what's going on in there. But why don't we call this a differential? It differentiates power between two wheels. Yeah, it basically transfers power between two wheels. You get this rear axle assembly here. And whenever you're going around a curve, one of them's going to roll faster than the other one, so you got to have some gears in there to let that happen. That's not that complicated, really. But, um,. All right. This right here, your vehicle speed, first gear, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, you're actually trading, you're starting out with power and you're trading it for speed going up. You, some of you guys learned that last semester when we were in manual transmission. And this is a funky little graph that is made to do that. Your fuel economy overdrive. Somebody tell me what overdrive is. Overdrive is the highest gear that you have inside your transmission. Right. You explain it so that I can understand it. One to one. Yeah, but I need to know. I need to. But I'm I'm your girlfriend. I'm dumb. I don't know anything. You got to tell me better than that. Okay. It's a differential ratio of 0.85 to one. But the way that you, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't know it yourself. That's what Einstein said. The engine. The engine is spinning slower than the drive shaft. That's what overdrive is all about, and that's for fuel economy. Now, overdrive was first put on some of the older pickup trucks way back when in cars, and what they would do is they would take off in low, and they had a planetary gear set in there with a little solenoid and some stuff, and when they take off in low gear, is a column shift, you know, for how many of you have driven a column shift vehicle? Right. Uh -huh. You know, first, second, third, and then you pull it towards you and go up for reverse. Well, forward, you let off, you go and you let off and it would get another gear. While you were still in first, it would do it automatically. It would kick a planetary gear set in and give you an overdrive range in that gear. And then whenever you max the clutch, it would drop that out and you go to second. So you had six forward speeds in those things. And they were getting a phenomenal fuel economy. And uh, in the late 60s, they were uh, crabbing about, you know, the fuel economy was too good. So they took all that off of those manual transmission vehicles. Then they just put an additional gear in there later. But the long and short of it was there was a guy that was driving a, some kind of a 68 Chevelle that was all popped up that he had just bought. And he was up in, I heard about this, was up in North Alabama where the roads, some of the roads were long and straight. And he was out running the cops that Friday night. He was just taking off and leaving them and all that kind of stuff. And he'd spin around and come back and they'd try to get out of his way and all that. He was just having a big time. You know, of course, he knew when he got caught, he was going to probably lock him up and throw the key away, but he was having fun. And so they called this old uh, sheriff, and he had this old police interceptor that he had kept just for this kind of thing. And it, and those 64 Biscayne with some big police engine and a couple of carburetors on. So he takes off after this guy, and this guy's got his Chevelle running as fast as it'll go. The speedometer is already gone all the way around. It's hitting the post. And he was, and this car, the police car kept gaining on him. And when he looked over here, because he just had a four in the floor, he looks over here, and when, the, when this cop went by, went past him, he still, he pulled it down in high. He still had two gears left to go. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was amazing. But what it said was, you know, he said he knew he didn't have a chance about running that guy because he had that Chevelle going as fast as it could. That old bisque came past him, you know, and just kept <laughs> on. It just had a lot more left, you know, because it was a police interceptor. That's when they built the stuff, you know, to fly. And with a high speed rear end, it's just a funny story. Anyway, <clears throat> the outer wheels have got to rotate faster because the outer circle has bigger. That's what I was talking about earlier, right? There's your differential. Somewhere I got that little differential thing laying around here that I like to hold up and talk about. We talked about this before. Okay, here's your rear wheel drive drive train. This is a sort of a top. Uh, incidentally, this is reprinted with permission from the 49 Auto Workers Union, and it's actually off of a Ford handout that we got a long time ago. Okay, so here we got U joints. Why do we need U joints? 
This is going to be some pretty basic stuff, but there are some things you think you know that you don't, huh? Yeah, you're basically the uh, suspension is going to move, the body of the car is going to have to stay still, and you've got to have this turning shaft that's driving the part that's moving. So you're going to have to be able to continue to provide uh, turning power while these two plate things are moving separately. And that's what these U-joints are for. Now they can't bend a whole lot without getting hard. How many of you have put a long extension on, a, on something with a regular wiggler, like this, the plain old wiggler, in a socket and tried to spin it with an impact wrench or an air ratchet? Yeah. It goes, whoa, 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 you know, whenever you do that. Well, the one that's made for an impact wrench, it just doesn't do that. It'll bend a certain until before it stops, but it's always pulling the same. It doesn't get hard and easy. That's why they call that a constant velocity joint. These joints right here do the job that they need to do here, but they're basically, if you bend them too sharp, you feel them getting hard and easy, hard and easy, hard and easy. Okay, now, what is this right here? Yeah, well, that's the exhaust system. What's that? This is a surprise question, huh? Yeah, I'd say that's the catalytic converter and that's a muffler, but sometimes you'll see a catalytic converter and it looks like you got a muffler and another muffler. So it just makes it that much quieter when it resonates. Rear axle differential assembly seen from the top. Okay, who in the world, who has ever been stuck in the mud or in the grass? Who have ever seen the movie My Cousin Vinny? Yeah. Yeah. And so basically what she was talking about was, you know, if you're, if, when you're spinning the wheels, one of them on the right always spins and the one on the left is just sitting there. Uh, I actually, my dad had a 66 Chevy pickup with a straight six in it and uh, I was trying to get up out of the grass one time in the grass and I tacked it up a little too high and threw a rod out of his, <laughs> out of his truck. You know, I had to lay on my back and tear, take the pan off and take all the stuff in it. And then we popped a 283 in it anyway, you know, so he was better off, you know. Long and short of it was the spinning of those wheels. Uh, because of that differential is going to deliver it to that wheel there and then that's what your traction control stuff is all about. And the one that's got a limited slip differential have got some clutches in here and some special fluids, friction modifier stuff. Which I like to pass that little bottle of friction modifier around and let everybody smell of it. Who has smelled a friction modifier in here? I don't want to smell it again, that's yeah. for sure. And this, this really stinks, but uh, if you don't put friction modifier in the clutches that are, have their limited slip, whenever you're going around a curve you'll feel it, you know, doing this kind of stuff and that's one of the ways you can troubleshoot that. Anyway, transmission, U-joints, this is really not that complicated. Now front wheel drive is a little different. Here you got your CV axle, see, and engine, half shaft, half shaft, transaxle. And how many of you guys know what torque steer is? Torque steer, you ever heard of torque steer? You know what torque steer is, you ever heard of it? You ever get on a really high powered front wheel drive car? particularly an old one, and you really stand on it taking off, it goes, yeah. You ever had that feeling? Well, the real, why did it do that? Because the power is the front end, not rear end. Well, it's not just it. that. You've got two axles, one short, one's long. Okay, the short one's not going to twist as much as the long one. Here's how you do this. If you take a, a long extension and a really powerful impact wrench and you're trying to tighten something, loosen some of a nut, you know, or a bolt or something, I've seen people do this. They got a long extension, about 10 inches long or whatever. The impact wrench won't break it loose. Well, if you take that extension off and you put the socket right on the impact wrench, it spins it right out of there because of this twisting, torquing part of it. And you know the little dog bone, various colored dog bone things that they use at the, some of the Walmart places to tighten lug nuts? You use a different color, one for a different torque and all that. They're real expensive. I hate them. Because uh, they're like real, real high, and they're just made for lug nuts. So if you get the yellow one or the pink one, you're for a different torque. You just you can use your impact wrench to tighten them up. But you got to be, you know, make sure you do them all. We do them here with a torque wrench because I want you guys conditioned to do that. Long and the short of it is, you got a long and a short drive axle. The long one's going to twist a little bit. The short side's going to try to pass the other side. Now is the short axle always on the same side of the car? Mm -hmm. You know, some of the Honda Civics, you know, the engine and the transmission are in there backwards. Yeah. You know, and so that's what it, But what they've done is to minimize torque steer, is they put a good strong shaft coming out that long side, and they make sure that both of the CV axles are the same length. You know, they actually have a little jack shaft holding the end of this long shaft. You can see what I'm talking about. When you get under a car, you'll say, oh, that's what he was talking about, because you'll see it. Anyway, that's the deal there. Hey there, I'm trying to get my 
Yeah, let me um, let me get through this classroom session because I just started it. But, uh, give me about 30 minutes. Okay. This guys, everybody's wanting some work, man. Okay. Huh? Yay. All right. Now then, this is what torque steer was about. This is what we were talking about. And basically, there's some notes on this page below this. And uh, you can see what they're talking about there. Front, some front wheel drive vehicles accelerate rapidly, has a tendency to pull hard usually to the right, even though the steer wheel and front wheel are pointing straight ahead. Off to one side, because of the differential, the half shafts run equal lengths, and the right half shafts generally longer than the left on the ones that we're talking about there. Okay. All right, let me go. Now your CV boots, you gotta pay attention to those because if you look under there and you see busted CV boots, you can replace the boots, but it's usually not worth the trouble and the time to do it. It's $60 for a half shaft usually. Just put another half shaft in there and send that one back. But nowadays, $60, you don't even have a core charge anymore on most of them. But the, uh, the CV boots, they do have some that are split down the middle mm -hmm. so that you can just flip it right around. You don't even have to take the half shaft off. I don't like those because they don't usually stay together. You know, They usually come back apart at that split and you're back where you started. I mean, they, they may have some that are better than I think in Volkswagen. Uh, in the, the early bugs had some that had six little screws with washers and all that. But some of them, whenever you take them apart and put them, I mean, they're supposed to have glue to put them together and all this, but I mean, I've never seen any of those last. They actually have some with a $200 air tool that you can slide this uh, little accordion boot on and spread it out and go over there and let it come back and put clamps on it. Typically, we just throw a half shaft on it nowadays because they're getting everything new. And, uh, <clears throat> all right. Now here's your manual transmission. The guys that have already been through this are really going to enjoy it. Yeah. Isn't that right, Moodyo? You understand how this works? I do. do you, can you look at this and explain it? You can. You can, can't you? All right. Take that 1950s film for me to figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Let, let Let me come up here and talk about it. You come up here and explain how it is that what comes in here goes out there with several different gears. Can you do that? your overdrive. That's your uh wait a minute, where's the input shaft? Input shaft is right here. Is it? You better no, read the words. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Okay. Don't embarrass me. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> so where's the centerpiece? This is first gear? No, the big gear's first gear. That's right. Big gear's first gear, that's right. That's your reverse? And well it looks uh, you, like you it's can't. off on the other side. No, actually the reverse is visible and it's on this side of the all right, um, these are your synchronizers. So this shaft and this shaft are constantly spinning. All that matters is whichever one the synchronizer slips in to engage and actually connect it to this shaft, which is the output shaft. So when you have it in third or fourth gear, whichever one it is, that's the one that you have a one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah, that, yeah, and on this basis. whole thing is locked together. Even yeah. though this is spinning, this whole thing is locked together, and that's what's transporting all your power That's out. your one-to-one, -one. that's your fourth gear. That's your one-to-one. -one. Then you got your overdrive, which is usually smaller. You see how they're different sizes? That's where you get your different gear ratios. The smaller one over here is, it comes in, comes down, all the way up, over and out. Very good, now what about second gear? Second gear? I'm going to say, these gears are confusing, I don't like them. I'm going to say, this is second gear right here. No, that's not second gear, come on. This one is yeah, second gear. Yeah, there you go, keep going. Well, I, I'm looking at the Give me power flow for second gear. Second gear comes over, down, over, up, and out. No. Oh, come on. Almost. <laughs> You're almost right. I know this Which one. gears are always in mesh and always on? Okay, mesh. come on. So it comes over, down, over, up, and out. That's where it goes. All right, there we go. And then third gear. Tell me third gear. I do, Neil. All right, so this locks into place. You come over, down, over, up, and out. No, you're still on second gear. I need to go third gear. This is third gear. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I was in England. I was wrong. Okay. That's fourth gear. Now, what about first? First gear is this great big old guy right here. Yeah, okay. Because it's a ginormous one. Okay, give me the power flow. So you come over here to that gear, that gear, all the way up, over, and out. Now that's first gear. there. He knows that that's locks this on the, the output shaft. Yeah. yeah. If you remember yeah. that division, that's the he important part. He just endured a boat, uh, uh, 40 so I beat The division my between these two hour. shafts happens right here. That shaft and this shaft are not the same shaft, even though they call this the main shaft, it's not all one shaft, because it's got a bearing in here that enables these to turn separately. This one here is turning any time that one's turning. 
Now, what I always tell people about a manual transmission, if it's got a transmission oil leak, you better fix it because you're not always going to remember to go put oil in it and eventually it's going to wipe out this bearing and this gear. If you ever hear a manual transmission that's got a lot of noise in every gear except fourth, then this bearing is fried and it's very possible they could have run low on oil and it could have destroyed the cluster gear in that gear too. So this is where all the load is carried and everything except fourth. The loads carry here and it's transmitted back that way. So you'll, that seems a little bit, you'll get more chances to understand that as we go. Yes. Now everybody knows about a clutch, right? Who's, who, has, who, who has handled a clutch? You've handled a clutch. You put a clutch in there, didn't you? All right, so clutch, you know about clutches. The clutch basically, this is pinched between the pressure plate and the flywheel. This fork releases it. The newer ones have got a concentric cylinder, this hydraulic in there and all that. That little escort's got a little hydraulic actuator for this it's outside the bell housing and so on and so forth this right here is your transmission input shaft goes into a pilot bearing through those splines right there and that basically decouples the transmission from the engine every time you match the clutch and that's basically how that works that's what this drive line class is all about okay all right now you got an automatic transmission here's your stuff you got planetary gear clutches bands all pump valve body torque converter ring gear plenty gear some gear all of that stuff and you, we dig into that in, in a little deeper when we're doing automatic transmission. There's a typical automatic transmission. One of the things that was always uh, interesting to me is how difficult it is for anybody that wants to teach automatic transmissions to illustrate automatic transmissions and the way they operate. And everybody that does it tries to slice it, you know. And I don't know about you, but whenever they slice it, this doesn't do anything for me. Does that do anything for you? Can you look at this sliced open transmission and tell how it works? I can't. I mean, that doesn't mean you're dumb. If you look at this and you can't tell how it works, you're in the same place I'm at. I mean, that may be dumb too. But I mean, whenever you start stack and taking them apart and putting them back together, Lundy, did you do that last semester? You took one apart, put yes. them back together, yes. and all that. So basically, you stack all those. You understand it better when you've had them apart. And you hold the parts in your hands and you put it back together, you begin to, it begins to come clear. Once you get your head wrapped around it, it's not that complicated. I mean, although I guess you could build a case for it being somewhat complicated. But the long and short of it is, the coolest ones are the Chryslers, because you can go in there and plug your scan tool in and look at the various different clutch volume indexes, and if one of them is higher than the rest of them, you know that one's slipping. You know, right? and then you, look, you focus on that one when you go in there to build it. All right, then you got this, your Prindle stick. You know what a Prindle stick is, right? Pernal. I know what a yeah. is. PRNDL, you know, prag, you know, that's a stick. That's what that is right there. And this right here, that's your valve body here. Valve body is looks like a maze. You know what I mean? You say, oh my gosh, I'll never figure all that out. Well, you really don't have to. Basically, what you got to do is you got to pay attention to how it's all put together. There's valves and stuff in there. Let me show that exploded in a minute. I don't remember. But the long and the short of it is that's basically going to direct the oil to the clutches and the bands and the stuff that actually is going to act and react with different parts of the planetary gear and then there's some one-way clutches in there and all that now look at this this is interesting this is a little thing that helps you troubleshoot because it gives you information about where this oil goes to your one two shift valve your direct clutch basically is giving you the passage this oil takes you got a three two timing valve you got an EPC solenoid you know you can basically see how if you didn't have the direct clutch working and you had this valve right here that something was wrong it was causing it to dump all the fluid pressure to that clutch that clutch wouldn't apply then you wouldn't have your direct clutch but you look in your little uh, matrix and you say this clutch is operating in this gear and this gear if those two gears are the ones giving you the trouble the direct clutch is the one that you're actually going to focus on when you tear it down too many people just want to fly in there rip that baby apart Hope they find some bad parts, put it back together. You know, basically, you need to be looking into it, measure your pressure, see if they're low in any particular one. Anyway, that's what we're doing here. But these right here, if you think of it as a wiring schematic for the fluid. You see, and if you know your direct clutch is a problem, like for instance on this one here, you're going to look at everything that can affect that, basically, on this little thing. That looks complicated, but you're basically, how do you wire stuff up when you wire it up? One wire at a time. So basically, you look at the big picture that way. Now, you know, if this was really simple, then everybody would be able to do it without any kind of training. See this right here? There's your torque converter. This is bolted to the flywheel. This is welded to that. So this 
and this are all one piece when it's in the car. That, okay. Now this particular pressure plate is what gives you your one to one whenever you're in your high gear. You, you shift first, you shift second, you shift third. Third gives you your lockup, which is straight through from the engine all the way to the back. In other words, you don't have any slippage in third gear when you get into the wreck. And then that's your torque converter clutch when it's applied, see, but that usually happens in third and it stays locked up in fourth. They don't all just straight lock up anymore, though. Most of them now modulate. In other words, it'll go 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. And that's why on some of these cars you'll feel it surging or on the Crown Vickies when the friction modifier uh, is that causes this to slip smoothly, is worn out, it'll look feel like you know, you know the little strips of asphalt you run over on the way to a stop sign? <laughs> it'll feel like that. If you feel one like that when there's not any of those asphalt strips down there, you do a transmission service on it and that takes care of it. <laughs> All you gotta do is change the fluid. Then you're putting a fresh friction modifier back in there with the fluid if you use the right fluid. This is the turbine. The turbine connects to the to the shaft that goes into the transmission. These little flats on here can do it to the pump. And that's basically the fluid pump fills this up. Now, this place right here, as this fluid from this impeller, see these little turbine veins? What's in here looks just like that. And as this spins, it throws fluid against that and it turns that shaft. Now, this little torque multiplier here causes the fluid after it has already gone in there and hit those blades to come back in an angle so that it can hit them doubly hard. That multiplies your torque. And in the middle of it is a one way clutch. But where I'm getting at with that, and you'll learn more about that when, we, when you when you other guys finally get it on that transmission. But that's your torque converter, and that's where the heat is made in an automatic transmission. Somebody will be sitting in a with their uh, car in gear in a traffic jam somewhere on a hot day, and they just leave it in gear, and it tends to um, overheat and boil fluid out in the vent. So be careful to put it in neutral if you're sitting in a traffic jam. Hello. Hey. Hey, Alice. Yes, ma'am. You you can do that one day. Yeah, one day next week will be fine. Monday or Tuesday or whatever, Wednesday, whatever day is good for you. Yeah, well, you can plug it in this week if that work for you too. We can plug it in to see what it is. Okay, that's fine. All right. Yeah, that'll be something that that'll be that'll be something we can look at too. I got an idea that I know what's wrong with that, and I've got some guys that would just love to pull the gas tank off that Lincoln. Yep, we're gonna pull the gas tank off and do some work in there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think we can make that happen. Bring it on, we'll look at it. Alright. Okay, more work for somebody, more work for somebody. Alright, that's good. Okay, now then, look at this. Transmission oil cooler is not always inside the radiator end cap. Got me? Now, we had this Dodge Caravan, kind of like the one that was sitting there this morning one time. Comes in here, and it's basically got a, it's the, she says, well, the transmission feels funny, and they tell me down at the uh, filling station that it's got water in the transmission. And I said, well, and then my initial thought was, if these coolers in the end cap have been breached and they're letting coolant get into the transmission, we could have a big problem. Well, I pulled the dipstick and yeah, we saw some uh, milky looking stuff like there was water in it. And it was acting funky when it was shifted. But I said, I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if this radio... And then I got to look at it and it didn't have an internal cooler on the radiator. It only had an external one, which is a little pipe. It's kind of like the... Uh, the you know, you see there, here's our part. You got me some spec fluid? All right, but anyway, this is a kind of a funny story, but what we did was we replaced the solenoid body, which is on the outside of that transmission, and we did a full fluid exchange, because I don't know how the water got in there unless you went through a deep puddle or something. And uh, let's see, Mitsubishi, that guy's name is Webb, I could put that in there. All right, uh, you know what to do with that, don't you? Take that on me. Put those on the desk. All right, so anyway, uh, I'm telling you this for a reason. We did a full fluid exchange with our machine. We replaced the solenoid body, and she drove away on it. And I said, we may have to replace the transmission or rebuild it or something. We'll see what it does. And I wrote about that in one of my motor rage articles. And some guy sent me an ugly email, and he said, you're not ever supposed to do anything like that. You're always supposed to rebuild the transmission if even a teaspoon of water gets in it. 
And so this was like a year later because, you know, the article didn't come out right away. And so I called her up and I said, uh, how's that uh, caravan doing that we did that transmission work on? Well, I drive it to Montgomery every week and it's never given me any more trouble. Once you put thousands and thousands and thousands of miles on it. You know what the long end of that story is? Proof's in the pudding. If what you did worked, then the guy that's the self-proclaimed expert, he may have had an idea of how this was supposed to be handled, but the way that I think it's supposed to be handled is did we fix the car? Mm -hmm. See? And it, did we spend lots and lots of her money and time? No, we didn't. We got it done in a single day and she's been driving it ever since. She's still driving it, and she's never had any trouble with the transmission. One size does not fit all. Got me? All right. Tell you another thing that happened. This is crazy. Now, this guy called me out of Allen whenever he does the 93 Toyota Camry. He called me. He said, my car's overheating. It's up here at Perry's store. So I drove up there, and I looked at it. And you know what it's like when a head gasket gets blown, right? How do you know when a head gasket gets blown? You get wired in oil. Well, not just that. There's a zillion ways the head gaskets can blow, but usually when they overheat, they'll start punching uh, compression into the water. It's the most likely way. And then it starts getting hot really fast. Oh, well, not just that. Well, that is another story. But anyway, I pull the radiator cap off, he cranks it over, it starts up, and it's punching geysers of water out in the radiator. <laughs> you know? I mean, that's a blown head gasket. And typically, it's got that sickly sweet smell. You know what I mean? It's got a stinking sweet smell that you'll never forget if you ever smell it the first time. It's just, it's terrible. And you know, so I said, this has got a blown head gasket. We may have to put a head gasket on it. He said, okay, so we switched it off because yeah, his radiator had split. That was what the problem was. And so we, uh, he got a record to get it, and he brought it back over here, and I gave him a ride back, and we pulled it in. And I was going to show the students, this is what a blown head gasket is like. So we started it up, and everything was perfectly normal. It didn't do anymore. <laughs> I would have sworn on a court of law at that store up there that the head gasket was, was gone, because he had overheated it really bad. You don't ever, there's not any way that you can definitively say until you check it again when it's cool if the head gasket is blown or not. It usually damages. Most of the time you overheat a camera, it's toast. But anyway, the transmission cooler is it necessary because of what? Somebody back up. Where's the heat created in an automatic transmission? Torque the torque converter shears that fluid and makes the heat. Okay. Okay, here's your common customer concerns. Leaking fluid, poor shift quality, hard shifts, hesitating shifts, you know, late shift. That can result from worn out transmission, low transmission fluid. What if I told you I got in a car and I cranked it up in the morning and I put it in gear and it sat there for a second and then it caught. Yeah, that's low fluid. What if I told you that I drove off on it and when I went around the corner, it felt like it dropped into neutral and then it caught again? That'd be low fluid also. That'd be low fluid. What if I pull the dipstick out and I don't see low fluid? Is the engine running? Wrong dipstick. <laughs> that kind of thing. Somebody sticks the wrong dipstick back in there and it's actually reading wrong, it's reading full when it's not full, it can still be low on fluid. You know, one of the really good transmission mechanics I knew, this guy was driving one was doing it. He says, what do I do, what do I do? And he says, uh, it's showing full of fluid and this engine's warm, engine's running, all that kind of stuff. He add a quarter of fluid to it. He goes, but it says full. I don't care, add a quarter of fluid to it. He did, all the problem went away. See what I mean? Now, the easiest thing to do when you're doing transmission fluid is to let one be low on fluid when you think it's full. Now, the fluid expands. The water in the radiator, the coolant, expands when it gets hot. The fluid expands when it gets hot. If motor oil expands when it gets hot, I don't know if I've ever been able to detect it. Transmission fluid does, coolant does. Okay, you got that? And uh, automatic transmission fluid is also good for oil in your machine gun too, by the way. So, All right. Checking for proper fluid level. Some of them now have lifetime fluid in the transmission. Some of your Mercedes cars and all that fluid you're never supposed to change. Uh, that fluid, the transmission on the floor back out there came out of 2007. A charger. It's a Mercedes transmission. It's got a dipstick tube, but no dipstick. I got an $88 tool. You got to get the fluid to a certain temperature to run that thing down in there, and it basically touches the bottom of the pan. It's got millimeter graduations. You need to how many how many millimeters deep it is. I like that. Ford's got transmissions without dipsticks. Chevrolet's got transmissions without dipsticks. The smartest people I've seen are the Mercedes. That the transmission guy has got a dipstick he can use, and he can put fluid in with the top instead of having to raise it up on the lift and do all these shenanigans like you have to do all those other ones, with all due respect. All right, okay, four-wheel drive. Got a transmission, got a transfer case, got a front drive shaft. Got it? Front differential. Got a differential back there, got a differential up here. Everybody got that? All right. This, this opener takes a little longer than we usually stay in here. 
whenever you put a vehicle in four wheel drive, what's coming out of the front differential has got to make it out of the hub and it's got to drive the wheels. Now, you might notice a lot of the vehicle, like our old Bronco out here, has got these you know, knobs you've got to turn out there on the hubs to put them in four wheel drive to lock the, those axle shafts to the hub so they'll pull the front wheel. Most of them nowadays are done with a vacuum. How would I do that with a vacuum? Yeah, how do I do it with a vacuum? I've got a shaft coming out of the differential. I've got another shaft going out of the wheel. I've actually got little splines on the ends of these two shafts, and they're butted up against each other, but they're not connected until the sleeve slides over all those splines. Ta-da! So you got a fork with this vacuum. When you put it in four-wheel drive, it automatically spins up and starts spinning the front drive shaft. We start spinning the front differential, and the hubs are locked whenever the little collars go out. That was something that Jeep was doing a long time ago. Jeep wrote the book on four-wheel drive. You know what I mean? Smoothest way to do it. Okay, you got automatic four-wheel drive. Now, what is drive line wind up? Anybody got any idea? What's going to happen if I take my Bronco and I've got the front the front hubs locked? And a lot of front hubs are automatic. You know, not all of them do the collar thing I was talking about. Some of them lock automatically out here in the end of the collar. All right, if I put it in four-wheel drive and it starts spinning them and it locks the axles in and I'm on drive pavement, what's going to happen? I back out of the stall, I turn the wheels and everything winds down and comes to a halt. And it feels like something just stopped me. And then I pull back forward and all that unwinds and I'm rolling free again. That's drive line wind up. Whenever you got drive, whenever you have four-wheel drive, you need to be on gravel or mud or something so the wheels can kind of spin independently of each other and not wind up. If you're on dry hard pavements, that's not going to work unless you have one that's set up for all-wheel drive and it's got a viscous coupling in there that lets it slip and still delivers power. I'm kind of moving pretty fast on this. Uh, these, there's a little electric motor on the transfer case on these electronic uh, four-wheel drive transfer cases. And one of the things that you're going to do this semester in driveline is you're going to take the transfer case apart and you're going to see how it works. You're going to put it back together. It's part of what we do in here. And there's one over there that's got an electric motor on it. The electric motor is what actually it's got a glorified wiper motor because it's got a little subcontacts in here, you know, that basically tells it where, which gears it's in and all that. And that motor likes to crap out. My Ford F-150, the motor crapped out while I had it in four low. Yep. And I drove it for two days in four low. And finally I figured out what it was and I actually, I pulled the motor off and I manually changed it into to too high. That's right. That's what you, if you can do that, you know the transfer case is fine. And that motor, I like to pull, hold a motor in my hand, and I like to turn it, you know, with the wires plugged in, and I like to change it and see if it'll move. That's what I was trying to do, and it wouldn't turn. Yeah, you were thinking clearly. Now, I will tell you this, Sean Breck, and I mean Sean Breck, Sean Grant was telling me about one that Harper Electric had, an F-250 they had to go get, and they were driving down the road about 70 miles an hour, and there was a recall on this at Ford Head, and it, uh, something happened to the electronics or something shorted out, and it went into four-wheel drive going down the road, four-wheel low. <laughs> Oh, and the man. transfer case exploded like a bomb. <laughs> I mean, but they basically, yeah, it was a disaster area. But I mean, that was something that they had to fix. Got road noise. Four-wheel drive vehicle might have additional road noise during aggressive tire tread, driveline noise, driveline wind up. People not familiar with the operation may be confused. And listen to that. We're already at the end of our handout. Now we're going to go through our little test here. Yeah, is going through our test good? Is it our friend? You got a test that I gave you already. There's your opener. I got a pen I can use. Uh, I'll give you it don't have a pen? I've been bringing one every day and forgot it. That is my pet peeve with somebody that doesn't have a pen. Uh, can you sharpen that pencil? Yeah, with a sharper. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Amateur doesn't bring a pen. All right. Now then, let's turn this thing around. We're going to talk about. We're going to talk about our test. Go through it. We'll be through in a minute. Then we go back out in the shop and get the rest of our work done. You got it? All right. He's got, a, he's got his pencil sharpened. The automatic transmission's hydraulic system uses transmission fluid under pressure directed through what? Well, wait a minute. What's going to shift the gears automatically? What does the fluid go through in order to make it go into the different gears? What component? We talked about it. What is, it that, what, is it, what is it that enables the transmission to shift automatically? What does the fluid go through in order to make that happen? Uh, oh, the valve body. The valve body. That was the answer we were looking for. Valve body. 
Uh, what's the purpose of the transmission? Oh, that's to um, transmit in, or power from the engine to the wheels? Sort of, but what you're basically wanting to do is you want a bunch of different gear ratios. I've got an engine. How many, uh, uh, how, you know, how many thousand pounds does a car weigh? A couple thousand, five thousand? Yeah, depending on the size of the car. The engine doesn't have enough power to pull that car unless you've got it going through some gears. Gear ratios. You know, like you got a 10-speed uh, bicycle. Anybody ever ride one of those? Yeah. Yeah, I got one. Okay, what are, what are you doing? What's your legs doing when you're in uh, low gear? Well, no, in low gear, you're actually going faster. Yeah. It's less energy, but it's more speed, right? Then you go to second gear, it's a little harder, but you're going faster. Third gear is a little harder, and you're going faster. When you get in the highest gear, your feet aren't moving very much, but you're sailing, right? But when you start up a hill, you better go back to a lower gear because you're going to have trouble pulling that hill, right? There's been times where I wanted to start off with that bike in high gear just because I didn't feel like switching, and it yeah. was tough. Yeah, it's really hard. Okay. That's like uh, when I was telling them these guys the other day that were riding with me. Uh, well, if you're wanting to see if an engine is going to misfire under load, how would, what's the best way to do that? 45 miles an hour. 45 miles an hour, torque converter locked, highest gear that you got, crowd the throttle just a little bit, and hold it just a little crowded going up a hill. And that's almost in too high of a gear for that speed and load. And what that does is it, the engine will skip then if it won't skip any other time. Boom, 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 you know. All right. Uh, so the purpose of the transmission is to provide gear ranges that will enable the engine to pull a car that otherwise would be too heavy for the engine to pull. Uh, the blank allows each drive wheel to rotate with the same amount of power, but at different speeds when necessary. Differential? That's the differential. All right. You got that? All right. Let me turn that off. Okay. Uh, torque steer occurs on some front wheel drive vehicles. Why? Uh, because the half shaft is inside those half shafts. That's right. You got that. Different size half shaft. Make sure you're at that so that it can make sense to my work study student because she doesn't understand what you wrote. She will mark a big red X on it. She's very militant. I told her to make me a sign saying don't block doors on the other side. You know, she's from Long Island, New York, and so she's got this, you know, hard bitten way about her. So she makes a sign that says, if you park your car in front of this door, it will be towed away at your expense, and we will have you arrested. And she didn't, you know what I'm saying? So I had to go back and, no, she didn't say we have you arrested and all that. But. Okay, look at here. What is uh, number one in this diagram right here? Number one. The output shaft. Oh, he's looking at him. He's just really sharp. Yep, output shaft. What about number two? Input. Input shaft. And number three is something that you may have trouble with, synchronizers, right? Uh, three, notice three is on in two places. It's pointing at the one on the end. It's pointing at the two up in the middle. Synchronizer. And what's number four? Countershaft. Countershaft or cluster gear. You can call it either one and it'll be right. Huh? Flip it over, Brian. All automatic transmission vehicles use what to keep the transmission? They have to have a cooler. If you don't have a cooler, it's going to get hot. And now most of them will, if it gets too hot and starts to percolate the fluid, it starts pushing it out the vent and it just runs out from under the vehicle. And that's what I was talking about if you're in a, if you got it sitting there and drive and you're in a traffic jam in St. Louis or somewhere and you just sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there within the drive, it's going to start percolating the fluid, it's going to boil it out, it's going to be all over the pavement. So if you have to do that, put it in park or put it in neutral. Like you said, in a drive through a long time, you know. Same thing. Um, if, you know, if you start understanding more about how a vehicle works, you'll actually start doing things differently. <laughs> you know, if I'm sitting in the drive through I kick mine up in neutral just because. Because that's on my mind. You know, I don't want my transmission overheating, sitting there sharing the fluid. And like, yeah. uh, most four-wheel drive vehicles are set to run in two-wheel drive because of what? No. What did I say? I had a, no, I had a very... Uh, extensive little exposition I gave about a principle called wind up. Yeah, remember all this wind up talking? Everybody's like, oh, I remember now, even though it was two and a half minutes ago. <laughs> okay. Uh, to disengage the front drive train from the wheel, the four-wheel drive vehicle may have... Uh, that's 
the locking hubs. The locking hubs. Or the vacuum actuators. Yeah. Uh, drive line wind up happens when. Come on, guys. I talked about this at length. Four wheel drive on hard pavement. That's right. You're supposed to be in mud or gravel or something. Current model vehicles use a blank, which prevents the engine from being started unless the clutch pedal is fully depressed. Huh? Yes. Back in 1983, I was working at a Volkswagen dealership in Enterprise, which is not even there anymore. The building's still there, and it's not far from where I live. But anyway, those vehicles didn't have clutch safety switches. Brand new cars, you know, before clutch safety switches came out. And this guy, I always pulled vehicles in on my left, and every time I pulled a vehicle in on my left, I put it in neutral because I might want to move it around to make sure the lift would line up right, okay? So I just got used to that. Now, this is important, so don't, uh, don't tune me out here. The guy pulls the vehicle in, and this is where problems happen. Somebody else is involved in the job, and they do something you don't expect. He pulls it in. He leaves it in first gear. Every time I put one on my left, I put it in neutral. All right. So it was pulled up and it was facing this. The, the parts room was like along that wall right there. And here's the parts window. And there's a, con a block wall just like that one right there. And it was about as far as from Moody to that block wall was where that car was parked. And I did some work under the hood that I didn't have to start the engine for. And when I got through with it, uh, the guy that had pulled it in says, don't forget you were going to set the idle speed before you close the hood. And I said, oh yeah, I forgot about that. And like I would always do when I parked the car, I just reached in there and hit the key and started it just through the window. Remember, it didn't have a clutch switch. And nobody was standing in front of it. But when it started up, it was in gear and it took off and ran into the wall. And it caved those block wall in, and it pushed the file cabinets around the wall away. And the lady that was working in the office thought the end of the world had come. <laughs> because she was, ah, you know. <laughs> so, but what happened was, uh, because of the fact that he pulled it in, left it in gear, you see. And I should have checked it to see if it was in neutral. But you know what amazed me about that thing? I figured it was going to have destroyed the front of the car. There wasn't a scratch anywhere on the front of that car. You could never tell it it hit anything. But it caved that block block wall. <laughs> I mean, it went that far. And I imagine if you go over there now, if somebody's fixed that, I can take you to that spot and show you that that block wall is still caved in. <laughs> anyway, that's the long and the short of it is a clutch switch. Now, what four-wheel drive vehicles have you run into that have a defeat button for the... Yeah, some of them have a defeat button for the clutch switch because when you're in a four-wheel drive situation, you don't need to match the clutch sometimes. You just need to be able to start the engine with the clutch released. And so, anyway, that's you're going to see that on some of them, a little uh, thing like that. Okay, anybody got any questions? The torque shear thing, it's called the half shaft, right? Yeah, the half shafts are, ones that are going out one from the uh, other. Yeah, one. When one's longer than the other one, you're going to have a problem with torque steer. But yeah. most vehicles, I mean, uh, drive lines have been tuned to now, so you just won't have that problem anymore. You don't typically have that. Used to, it was a big deal, but you almost never feel torque steer anymore. I've seen some vehicles where the actual half shafts are the same size, mm -hmm. the left and the right. Yeah, they will, but they've got a little bar that's taking up the distance, you know. Now, one time I drove a little Ford Escort that was turbocharged. I've never had seen a turbocharged Ford Escort before or since. And it was an 85 model, and it was a limited edition, and it had a blacked out grill, and it was from Ford like that. I don't know how many of them they made, they didn't make very many. And when I opened the hood, I said, this stupid thing's got a turbocharger on it. This thing looks like a pancake. It's the dumbest looking turbocharger I've ever seen. Ha yeah. ha, this is funny. Ha ha ha. And so I got through with the work I had to do on the car. It was nearly a brand new car. And I got, you know, I, when you drive a lot of escorts, when I was working at the dealership, you just get used to the way they run, you know. Oh, oh, oh. Well, on that one there, when I got into second gear and that little green light came on that said I had turbo, that thing broke the tires loose. It got torque gear, and everybody jerked me into the ditch and scared the daylights out of me because, boy, was it ever powerful. I couldn't believe that. Whoa, you know, scared me silly. All right, so that's the end of the story today. And uh, time for us to go back out into the gym.